Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Hartell from UMGC, and I want to talk today about making peace with AI in the classroom. Bottom line is that the culture of education will need to shift to accommodate and reflect the larger cultural shift we are seeing with the adoption of AI tools in the workplace. We need to be thinking about how we can work with rather than against AI tools in the classroom because there are some significant benefits to helping students use these tools critically. Uh, as you can see, I've outlined some of those benefits here. First, by using tools openly in the classroom, we are going to expose them to this emerging technology that's changing almost day to day. And that exposure is going to happen in a controlled setting. Secondly, classrooms provide students with low stakes settings to practice using these technologies. If they make mistakes, it's a lot better to correct and discuss them in the classroom rather than at a job where the consequences could be more dire. Thirdly, AI is a fantastic accessibility tool. For example, individuals with ADHD have what is called an interest-based nervous system. If they aren't interested, it's a struggle. So they can use ChatGPT to summarize the main points from a boring reading into bullet points, making it easier for them to engage with the material. And finally, by permitting regular use of AI in the classroom, we're going to be better preparing students for the future workforce. A recent article in The Atlantic emphasized how querying AI is going to be one of the most important job skills in this century. Prompt engineering, as this is coming to be known, AI is only as good as the person prompting it, and our students need practice with that. There are some common concerns, however, with bringing it into the classroom, and these generally fall under these categories. There are concerns about biases in our culture that AI picks up on and replicates. There's instructor discomfort because a lot of us haven't even ventured into using these tools yet. There's concerns about cheating. And finally, there's general ethical concerns. The first one I want to talk about, which is perhaps I think one of the most important, is the issue of bias. A language-based learning model is like a layer between you and the data. It's what allows you to get access to the data. It's like a search engine, but different. Uh, it gives you back the information in fully formed sentences rather than a list. So there's two kinds of biases I see built into this process. The first form of bias is in the output language it uses to communicate with you. Unless you give it different parameters, it defaults to using a kind of professional language that is used in so-called professional settings. We can ask then questions like, who determines the standards of more formal professional language in the first place? Is that kind of language culturally inclusive or even appropriate for communicating with all people in all cases? The second form of bias you have is in the training data set. The data set is going to have embedded within it all of the issues that we have historically had regarding gender, race, sexuality, ethnicity, etc. because it is data from our often troubled past. Thus, as a user, you have to be aware of these built-in potential issues so you can spot them when AI's fail-safe methods glitch out or something is just not caught in its processes. Another problem is that the data sets used to train AI language models are not particularly transparent. We know what they are in general, but are there enough academic resources, books, peer-reviewed studies, expert information within that data? Did the dark trenches of Reddit and troubling blogs get in there and remain part of it? from a web crawler data set. We have some information about how OpenAI performed data scrubbing for problematic information by outsourcing it to Kenyans, but what guidelines did those scrubbers have? What cultural biases did those workers bring into their decision-making about what was and what was not appropriate to include in the data? We don't know. So because of these kinds of issues, it's absolutely necessary to always have this matter of embedded biases in mind when it comes to this kind of technology and any kind of technology, really. And in the classroom, we should be open with students about how to mitigate these issues, how to identify them, how to take something that a language model says and interrogate it for what is there and what might be missing. If we don't do this kind of reflection, we might not be able to avoid replicating some of the oppressive power structures embedded in our past data. The second category of concerns is instructor discomfort. Many of our students are younger than us, and they are just more tech savvy. I will say very directly that if you're not comfortable with using AI tools, please start using them. It's important to become comfortable with these tools because our students are going to use them whether we know it or not. We need skills to identify its use, help students use it responsibly, and even use it in our own work. Also, if we want to be models for critical engagement and usage of these tools, we can't do that if we're not using them. 
Our related concern here is cheating and rethinking what that is. We've been conditioned into this punitive model of catching students not doing their own work. If students query AI and get information from it, is that cheating? They're still researching, except now the information is being provided to them in usable sentences. They can edit those sentences, rewrite them, work them into their own compositions, but is that cheating? Or is that a form of knowledge curation? I want to suggest that it's a form of curation. I also want to suggest that rethinking our understanding of what cheating is with AI mirrors what we had to do in the past once you could find information about anything online. We helped our students develop critical thinking skills to be able to tell reliable from unreliable information. And now we have to do this again, but in a different way. One of the ways to rethink cheating is also through a lens of transparency by providing students with ethical guidelines for use. And I'm gonna tie that into this last category of concerns about ethics. We already covered biases, and the second item here is fact-checking, and that can be quite important depending on what tool you're using. Morton Rand Hendrickson, a technology ethicist, calls ChatGPT3 a BS machine. Uh, with its thoroughly reasonable tone and professionalism, it can convincingly present almost anything as if it's true. If you ask it to give you a quote from a historical figure, it might give you a real one, but more often, it will give you a completely fake quote that sounds completely plausible because it has enough information about that person to speculate successfully on what they might say. So for now, you really can't ethically use all forms of this tech without fact-checking it and interrogating its output for veracity. There's also an issue of accountability, and that's related to the issue of cheating that I already mentioned. It's not really ethical to use AI to write your entire paper and not let your professor know you're doing that. And even the MLA now has a guide for citing generative AI text. So with these things in mind, I recommend writing specific student guidelines for the ethical use of AI tools and having students sign a usage agreement so that the use of AI can be done in a transparent way in your classroom. Um, here I have a sample classroom usage agreement I included a link to this and some sample guidelines in the resources for this event if anyone is interested. I used these in my recent technology and culture class and it went really well. Students documented when they used AI and many of them told me that they used AI to help them understand some of the more complicated readings by asking AI to summarize it for them. So finally, where do we go from here? This tech is developing really fast. AI tool development is happening much faster than our classroom institutional policies can be created. And that's a bit of a problem. If we can't stay ahead of it with specific policies, we're going to have to compensate by developing general guidelines and general policies that are forward thinking rather than reactionary. And we need to be transparent in how these tools are used in our education process. A second issue is a growing digital divide between faculty and students. Many faculty may not even want to be involved in learning anything about AI tools for whatever reason. So this divide is likely to increase as students keep up with the tech and not all the faculty do. We should certainly be thinking about ongoing faculty development opportunities to encourage faculty to keep up with AI tools. AI-assisted work involves a completely different way of understanding and producing knowledge, which is what we do in the classroom. Uh, it changes the knowledge production game, and you can't play that game unless you know what AI tools can do. To wrap up, I want to come back to the self-reflective aspect. As you begin to incorporate AI tools into your work and teaching, it's important to come to AI language models with a good sense of how to query AI and a sense of its limitations and potential biases. Otherwise, you may not know if what you are creating with the help of AI is avoiding replicating the power structures that have been detrimental to particular groups of people in the past. If we are committed to creating inclusive classrooms, we should be committed to the self-reflective use of AI tools as well. So thank you very much, and I hope this was helpful.